people of the book, Pharaoh's daughter, and the four questions in a multitude of languages. Welcome to the Book of Life, your source for Jewish books, music, film, and web. I'm Heidi Estrin. The Book of Life is a podcast service of the Feldman Library at Congregation B'nai Israel in Boca Raton, Florida. Additional support comes from the Association of Jewish Libraries. This is the April 2008 episode. For all you armchair travelers out there, enjoy this international virtual taste of Passover. Geraldine Brooks won the 2006 Pulitzer Prize in Fiction for March, a Civil War novel centered around the father of the March family from Louisa May Alcott's Little Women. Her new novel, People of the Book, spins an imaginary history not for a pre-existing character, but for a pre-existing book, the Sarajevo Haggadah. Created around the year 1350, this illuminated manuscript is possibly the oldest Haggadah in the world. I spoke to Geraldine about the truth and fiction of the Sarajevo Haggadah by phone at her home on Martha's Vineyard. Geraldine, what is the premise of People of the Book? It's a novel that was inspired by the true story of the Sarajevo Haggadah. This book is a wonderful illuminated manuscript traded in Spain sometime around about 1350. I found that in recent history it had been saved twice from destruction by Muslim librarians, and that intrigued me. And then I found out that when it was in Venice in 1609, a Catholic priest's inscription saved it from going to the book burnings of that period. And um, going back further, there's not a lot known, but there's a lot of intriguing mysteries about the book. So I wanted to try and solve those fictionally. We've seen other stories that chronicle the history of a specific object, like Girl in Hyacinth Blue by Susan Freeland that follows a fictional Vermeer painting, um, or, or the movie The Red Violin. Yeah. Why is this such a compelling idea for storytellers to trace the history of an inanimate object? <laughs> Um, you know, I didn't see books exactly as inanimate. <laughs> For me, books are alive and, uh, you know, they're what defines us as human beings. So I guess it's not so much an object in particular as this one. Why is this one so lavishly illuminated at a time when most Hebrew thought was against illustration of any kind? Who is the African woman that's depicted in one of the illuminations in the Haggadah, enjoying the Seder meal with a medieval Jewish family. Just so many questions, and we can't answer them through research. So the only thing left is to answer them by trying to have an imaginative engagement with the past. Tell us about the title. What different meanings are invoked by the words people of the book? People of the book in Arabic, Akhil uh, al-Khatib, it's something that Muslims say very often when they're trying to reassure you that Christians and Jews are okay, you know, <laughs> because we are all people who have at the heart of our faith a sacred text. So, you know, Muslims look to the Quran and Jews to the Torah and Christians to the Old and New Testament. And so this idea of people of the book has that meaning. But it also has a more literal meaning in the terms of this novel because I wanted to write about the people of this book, the creators and the protectors of the Sarajevo Haggadah through the centuries. In all the long history that you've invented for this Haggadah, you never show it being used at a Passover Seder. Why is that? I know. And when somebody pointed that out to me, I just kind of slapped my forehead and said, Oi! <laughs> <laughs> and now I wish I could go back and write that section where everybody would be living in peace because there were, of course, hundreds of years where Jews did manage to live in peace without trauma and disaster. And as soon as I had the thought, I thought I could tell exactly how to write it and what would be the way into it because in the actual Sarajevo Haggadah, 
there's one page where a child has scribbled all over the parchment, practicing letters. And I thought that would have been the perfect introduction into that section where the parent comes in, sees the kid desecrating the wonderful book, hits him upside the head, you know. And then you see just domestic Jewish life taking its course and preparations for a Seder. And it would have been a great thing to have included. So I was just, uh, I guess, so fixated on the drama that I didn't see that opportunity. That's very funny. This book is historical fiction, but the Sarajevo Haggadah is a real book. How much of this story is true and how much is conjecture? You know, roughly speaking, the farther you go back in time, the more the thing is made up out of whole cloth because we really know nothing about the circumstances of this book's creation. We don't know who the artist was. We don't know who the sofer was. We don't even know what part of Spain it was made, really. We think it was somewhere near Barcelona, but we're not too sure. And we don't know exactly when. And we don't know why it was illustrated when so many other Hebrew books weren't. So there's a lot that's just totally invented. But I've used the book itself to suggest plausible answers to me. But then the closer you get to living memory, the events hew quite rigorously to the known facts of how it was rescued during World War II and how it was rescued again during the Bosnian War. You must have done a huge amount of research as you wrote this book. What did you learn that really surprised or intrigued you? Oh, so many things. Oh, the list of the things I didn't know when I started to write this book is so long, but I got to stand with a surfer and repair a Torah to see how a surfer actually goes about his work. I got to see how book conservators work on ancient parchments. Venice, I had no idea that we get the word ghetto from Venice, where it meant metal foundry, because that was the first place in Europe where Jews lived separated from the Gentile population. The horrors of torture during the Inquisition, unfortunately now reinvigorated by the CIA in waterboarding, direct from the, the Spanish Inquisition to today. Um, just an endless and fascinating journey. Geraldine, I understand that you were brought up Irish Catholic, but later became a Jew by choice. Yeah. What led you to your connection with Judaism? It was largely through my father, who had served in Palestine during World War II. He was actually an entertainer with the Australian Army. And he was a lefty socialist, and so he became absolutely caught up in the romance of the young kibbutz movement. So that was the beginning of it, I think. And I was a kid who got obsessed with things, so I had this whole period in my junior high school years where I was obsessed with the history of the Jews, and I used to haul around dog-eared copies of The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. And I used to wear a Star of David with my Catholic school uniform, which was pretty amusing when you think about it. So for me, it was always about history, more than faith. And then it turned out that I found myself in love with and planning to marry a Jewish man. Because of that connection to the history, I didn't want to be the end of the line for a Jewish family. So it seemed to make good sense to embrace his heritage and uh, pass it on to our son. This is a story full of book conservators and scholars and bookbinders, scribes and illustrators. All of us book geeks will find ourselves in there. <laughs> Um, and personally, I can't help but be charmed by the dedication that reads, For the Librarians. Why did you single out librarians for this honor? Well, because I was so impressed with the two librarians who were the ones who recognized that what unites us is greater than what divides us, and one of them was Dervish Corkut during World War II, and he kept this book out of Nazi hands at great personal risk, and the other was and Vera Mamovich, who went in under shelling to bring this book to safety during the siege of Sarajevo. But there are many other librarians in Sarajevo where books were really under attack, deliberately targeted, because the ultra-nationalists wanted to wipe out any record that there had been this thriving multicultural city. And so they burned down the National Library and they destroyed the Oriental Institute and so many books were lost, but some were saved because so many librarians risked their lives and formed human chains to evacuate the books and so forth. 
and then I was thinking about, you know, they're not the only brave librarians because librarians in the United States were the only ones who had the guts to stand up to the Patriot Act. So, you know, the librarians are always the gutsy ones. That's great. Geraldine Brooks, thanks so much for speaking with us. Oh, it's been a great pleasure. The music of Pharaoh's Daughter is a combination of Middle Eastern traditional sounds, psychedelic rock, world music, and ancient Jewish texts. This heady mixture reflects the real-life experiences of band leader Basia Schechter, as she told me by phone from her home in New York City. Basia, tell us a bit about your travels and how you discovered world music. I was introduced to experiencing foreign cultures by the fact that I was in yeshiva in Israel, and they politely asked me to leave. <clears throat> we did things like go to the Clockwork Orange, like we'd see the film over and over again. We were dancing in rock shows. We, like, created dances, and we were pretty much up all night running around town and going to bars and things like that that were just pretty unacceptable for very orthodox yeshiva girls. So I was left with a ticket and, like, four months left fill up. So I first went to Egypt and that was my first exposure to really living in a foreign country because Israel was really more like home. So when I traveled, I always traveled to places that I could afford and that was always more like third world countries and countries with really deep and steep ethnic heritages, musical heritages. What are some of the countries that you traveled to? Besides Egypt, I traveled to Turkey, Eastern Turkey, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Uh, Malawi, Morocco, um, Cyprus, Rhodes, Greece. I traveled through Bulgaria, Romania, and I spent time in Czech Republic, Hungary, um, Jamaica, Peru, Colombia, um, the Amazon, Western Europe also. Mali is one of my biggest influences. The West African tradition of music is cyclical and deep and completely meditative and real and true. It's just some of the best music and very inspired by that genre. Wow, you've been all over. I haven't made it to Asia yet. Um, I read somewhere that you had songs without words, and then you had all of these words, all of these prayers or... Texts that I grew up with, yeah. Texts. Right, all of these texts that didn't have music, and you you kind of combined them. Can you talk about that? Um, you pretty much said it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you tell it. Um, basically, as my music evolved by being exposed to foreign cultures, you know, when I was in Turkey, I was exposed to the saz, and so when I heard the saz, I wanted my guitar to sound like that. I was at a bar in eastern Turkey in Cappadocia. This man was hitting on me, and instead of hitting on me, I told him he should teach me the instrument he was playing. I thought that would be more constructive use of our time. <laughs> Adding these elements into the way I started to compose music didn't make sense to sing in English over it anymore. As English started to sound corny, I started to realize I'd memorized so many texts growing up in school. I memorized texts from Pirkei Avot, Tons of prayers, tons of biblical passages. So I had all these words in my head that I had always known. And some of them just seemed to fit perfectly onto the music that I was writing. They sounded like they went together by nature. Why is your band called Pharaoh's Daughter? In the Bible, there is a story about Pharaoh's daughter who saves Moses. And there's a commentary called Medrash Rabbah that explains that because Pharaoh's daughter recognized a higher power than her father. She was supposed to be called Basia, which means daughter of God. And that was really truly her God-given name because it connected her with her purpose. And uh, my name is Basia. So in trying to come up with the name of a band, what better name than who I'm named after, Pharaoh's daughter. And why is your new album called Haran? 
uh, when I was in that bar in Cappadocia, that's eastern Turkey, I was looking at a map and trying to figure out where to go next. And when I saw the city uh, on the map, Haran, it was a huge shock to me because that was a city that I had learned so many times in school. That was a city where Abraham started his spiritual journey. It was a place where he lived with his father, Terach, and he smashed the idols there. It's the crossroads, it's the trade route. There were so many different things that I had learned growing up in yeshiva about that city, and I I had never seen it on a map before because all the places that I knew from the Bible were mostly in Israel. So to see this in the Turkey where, the, where I was only like maybe 10 hours away by truck, I got myself on the road, stuck out my thumb, and headed out to Haran. What was Haran like? It was one of the oldest cities that I'd seen. It had such a deep, biblical, untainted feel to it. It didn't feel like it was touched by modern society at all. And yet it was also a bustling city. So I think that combination was a very unusual one because you can go to Istanbul, but Istanbul is completely touched by modernity. Um, you can go to Cairo, and Cairo is touched by modernity. But that was a city that I'd gone to that really felt that besides the buses and the cars, felt very untouched and very ancient. What's your next project? We have our annual Passover macaroon concert at Joe's Pub in New York City on April 24th. We're going to play a lot of the songs from Haram this year, and we're going to give out free macaroons, all different flavors, and have it on all the tables. That's great. How how many years have you been doing that? Um, this is probably our fourth, three or fourth year doing the annual Macaroon Passover concert. And another funny thing is that many people who come to Farrah's Daughter concerts on a first date get married. That's so funny. We've gotten, like, at least 10 couples tell us stories about how their first date was at a Pharaoh's Daughter concert. And especially this macaroon concert produces a lot of married couples somehow. So, yeah. <laughs> Ilana Kirshen's new book is called Why Is This Night Different from All Other Nights? The Four Questions Around the World. Ilana has compiled 23 translations of the famous Seder questions about matzah, bitter herbs, dipping vegetables, and reclining in our chairs. Brief histories of Jewish life in those 23 cultures reveal patterns of persecution, but also an unquenchable creativity. I spoke to Alana by Skype at her home in Jerusalem. Thanks to Alana for the interview, and thanks to musician Dan Krim for his blues rendition of the four questions. Alana, what inspired you to compile translations of the four questions from the Passover Seder? At Random House, um, there's an editor there named Alti Carper, who is actually now the editor of this book. And every year, she would ask someone else to translate the Manish Tana into a language that that person knew. And it was a very diverse group of people in that publishing house. 
And so one year she'd get someone from India to do it. One year um, someone did Korean, Chinese, you name it, all these different languages. And she would then recite it in that language at her Seder. And I remember thinking this was such a great idea. And one day we all said, we should make a book of all these translations. And I guess that's how it all began. Why the four questions? What makes them stand out from the rest of the Seder as the words to focus on? Well, for many Jewish children, that's their first memory of the Seder, is reciting the four questions, sort of like a performance when, when a child recites the Manish Tanakh for the first time. But also, questions are really at the heart of the Seder. The point is, if we say these four questions, they'll generate other questions, and hopefully each year there will be more and more questions. Um, says in the Haggadah, Kol hamar belis ha'per mitzrayim harizim shubach. The more you can tell, the more discussion you can generate, that's praiseworthy. It's, it's a microcosm of what the whole Seder is about. How did you decide which languages to include in the book? I started out by going to a bunch of university libraries, and I discovered Hagadot from all over the world. The largest collection I found was at the Hebrew University Library in Jerusalem. Um, I could always find the money, so not because it would be four lines, and each line would begin with the same words. Even if it wasn't an alphabet I recognized, it could usually identify the money, so not. Initially, I just used all the languages I found, and then there were a few that I asked people to translate. You include the four questions in Latin, but in your description of Jews in ancient Rome, you say they mostly spoke Greek. Were the four questions ever really recited in Latin, or is that included kind of just for fun? As far as I know, they were not recited in Latin, but I am by no means a scholar in first century Palestine history or whatever. Um, actually, there was talk about this after, um, what was that movie called? The Mel Gibson movie? The Passion. After The Passion came out, there was a lot of discussion about, in that movie, the Jews spoke Aramaic and the Romans spoke Latin, and was that really how it would have been? So, yeah, I think that the educated Jews would speak Greek. But part of my motivation was I wanted to include all those languages that it was likely that people at the Seder might know. And because a lot of people study Latin in high school, I thought it would be fun to have it in Latin. Did you learn anything particularly interesting or surprising about Jewish life around the world as you were researching this book? Um, looking at the illustrations in a lot of these Haggadot, pictures of the children of Israel, they would be dressed like the people of that time. So when I found a Dutch Haggadah, <laughs> all these little Israelites all look like little Dutch boys from the Hans Brinker stories or like the Indian Haggadot, everyone has turbans on. So that was sort of fun just to look at all the pictures. And that was why I wanted to include illustrations too in the book to really paint a picture of Jewish life all around the world. Who will be reciting the four questions at your Seder this year? There is a chance it might be me. Um, I might be having a Seder with a group of friends, and I might be the youngest of them. <laughs> I don't know what language I'll recite them in, but I guess now I have a wide range of choices, so that's exciting. Alana Kershen, thanks so much for speaking with us, and happy Passover. Thank you for this opportunity, and happy Passover to you, too. After I'd interviewed Alana Kirshen, I learned of another book of translations called 300 Ways to Ask the Four Questions by Murray Spiegel and Ricky Stein. This book comes with a CD and a DVD to demonstrate the questions in living languages like Mandarin, Zulu, and American Sign Language, dead languages like Aramaic, and even joke languages like Klingon and Valley Girl Speak. This labor of love took 25 years to compile. Check it out at whyisthisnight.com. Why is this night, like, totally different from, like, all other nights? Like, tonight, we eat only grody, bitter stuff that, like, brings tears to your, like, eyes and, like, ruins your mascara. Next month, the Book of Life will celebrate Israel at 60. Don't miss it. In the meantime, we would love to hear from you. Email bookoflifepodcast at gmail.com. Post a comment on our website, or if your computer has a microphone, leave a two-minute voice message by clicking on the voicemail link on our website, 
The Book of Life is supported in part by the Association of Jewish Libraries, tending the Tree of Knowledge, and promoting Jewish reading by supporting Judaic libraries and librarians. Visit them on the web at jewishlibraries.org. Our background music is provided by the Freilach Makers Klezmer String Band from Sacramento, California, whose CDs feature upbeat music from Ashkenazic and Sephardic traditions with Brazilian, Gypsy, and Celtic influences. Borrow their CDs at the Feldman Library or buy your own copies at freilachmakers.com. To download episodes of the Book of Life podcast, visit us on the web at bookoflifepodcast.com. Links to the books and CDs mentioned on the show are available on this website. You can also hear the latest episode by phone. Just call 916-313-3820. Thanks for listening, and happy reading.